my intention is to give you a brief review of the clinical uh, presentation of this disease. And also, we will, Whitney and I will go in more detail on what preparedness we have been going through in the last week, which has been pretty hectic in Cherokee Nation trying to uh, prepare for uh, this uh, pandemic. So this is the outline. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about epidemiology, not too much, um, so the clinical manifestations. And then the questions, I'm gonna be addressing the questions that are more frequent that we've had in the last uh, one or two weeks from our providers that are in the urgent care emergency department or in the primary care clinics, uh, seeing patients with fever, cough, and asking us what to do. Uh, and then we'll try to leave some more space for any questions that you may have. So regarding epidemiology, um, so we do know that this virus, which is a uh, beta coronavirus, is uh, transmitted by droplets, very similar to influenza. And the importance of this is that usually to get infected from someone who has a respiratory infection, you have to be within six feet of that person. And the time that you have to be close to them varies according to the literature that you read, but it may go as short as three minutes and as long as 30 minutes. Um, this virus also spreads through fomites, so contact is a secondary spread, and there has been some reports recently that the virus is in the stool, although there's, it is not very clear if there's any uh, orofecal uh, transmission yet. I put airborne in question marks, and the reason is because we do have a recommendation from CDC to use airborne precautions, and this is becoming a problem because we're running out of equipment to practice airborne precautions. But we, it is not demonstrated yet that this virus is airborne, and I think it's just a recommendation of, of, ca of caution and trying to be safe as much as we can. But I will mention uh, two more things about this later on, so we don't panic when we're running out of N95 masks. Um, so if one, in the United States, uh, I'm sorry, in China, the close contacts of individuals who had COVID-19, 5% of them got infected. And the, and the study done in the United States is 0.45% of close contacts. As I mentioned, close contacts is someone was within six feet for some time, um, for, for a prolonged time um, by the patient who had an infection. So as you can see, it's, it doesn't seem to be very bad. The problem is that we enter in hundreds of close contacts every day, especially where we're working with uh, in settings in which we engage with a lot of, uh, of individuals. So one uh, individual who's infected with COVID-19 will transmit it to 2.7 other individuals, which is higher than, um, a bit higher than influenza. The other thing that I wanna mention is that, just put it into perspective, uh, the mortality of COVID-19 so far as we know it is about 10 times greater than the seasonal influenza mortality that we usually experience. The incubation period is 5.1, uh, average 5.1 days, but it, got, it can go as low, low as two days and as long as 14 days. 97.5% uh, of the individuals who acquire um, the infection will present symptoms within 11.5 days of uh, getting infected and only 1% will develop symptoms after 14 days. And that's why we have the 14-day quarantine recommendation, which will cover 99% of the individuals who are infected, but there's, there's always gonna be one out of 100 that's gonna slip um, this recommendation and you should just be aware of that. The main symptom is fever, 94% of the Chinese, uh, so this is a study reported in Lancet um, by the uh, Chinese uh, studies. Um, which are the first ones that are being published. So 94% of the individuals had fever, but the fever is low in like 40 or 50% of them. It's about 37.3 or higher, but uh, only 40% of the individuals have a uh, fever of greater than 101 at presentation. And the next uh, symptom that's common is cough, and 70% of the times it's a dry cough. Then you'll see other symptoms listed there that are less frequent, the, the GI symptoms are more frequent in children. But I do have to mention that in the Chinese cohort so far, only 2% of the infections have occurred in children. There's been no mortality in children less than 10 years old. 
Here in this uh, graph, in this slide, you'll see the laboratory findings and the radiology. The only thing I want to mention is that there's nothing very specific except that 40% of the patients present with lymphopenia. So if you have a patient that you cannot test them for whatever reason, and right now the reason is that we don't have enough tests, um, and you do a CBC and they're lymphopenic, that would, should be a, uh, a sign that this could be a COVID-19 infection. But by no means can you lose this use this to make or diagnosis or rule it out. And the other interesting finding is that most of these patients, 75%, present with bilateral infiltrates, usually in the periphery of the lung, um, and they uh, present as ground glass opacity. So that's another sign that is pretty frequently seen with this coronavirus. So what are the complications? It's the patients that do not do well will have sepsis, respiratory failure, um, um, ARDS, uh, heart failure, and acute kidney injury. And the predictors that have been determined in a study recently published in JAMA, who's not going to do well are patients ages 65 or greater, if they have an elevated LDH, if they have an elevated D-dimer, and if they develop neutrophilia during the infection. So these are, uh, the first one you can't modify, but the other three you can monitor and see uh, which patient will not do well. So predictors of mortality when um, the patient has an infection, uh, a high SOFA score, which is um, a score to evaluate severity of disease in patients who are getting admitted in the intensive care units. Or, um, and if you have a SOFA score of 4.5, um, your odds ratio of dying is 5.65 and a high D-dimer. The other thing is age, 1.1 odds ratio increase for each year of age. So the older you are, the higher your mortality rate, and I'll show you some numbers. The medium time of illness, and this is what you're going to have to expect on patients who get admitted, is 22 days. So the majority of the patients will not require hospitalization, that's about 80% of them. But in the Chinese cohort, about 17 to 19% of the patients required admission. And the average le le length of stays was 22 days. The average onset from illness initiation to this death is 18.5 days or about three weeks. And, and, and interestingly, these patients during the first week may not show any signs of deterioration. And when they're not going to do well, is that we, at the end of the first week that they start deteriorating, they require mechanical ventilations. And the ones who do not survive die around uh, week three. So there is some uh, speculation that this could be uh, an autoimmune injury to your lungs uh, triggered by the virus because of the timing of the lung injury and the death. So, um, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so in the Chinese cohort, most of the patients who got infected were 30 to 69 years old. That's 77.8% of them. And 19% uh, were critically ill. When you look at the second um, row, the case fatality proportion increased after age of 60. And if you are 60 to 69 years old, your mortality is 3.6%. If you're younger, for the whole cohort is 0.9%, so less than 1%. But if you're 70 to 79, 8%, and if you're 80 years or older, 14.8%. Also, if you have comorbid diseases, uh, your mortality increases. 10% for heart disease, 7% for diabetes, and 6% for the other ones that are listed there, COPD, hypertension, and cancer, or receiving immune suppressive therapy. If you have multiple comorbidities, the mortality increases. Why is it beyond the statistics? This is important to know because one of the things that are coming up in our health uh, facility is what do we do with providers or that will be in contact with patients and are older or have comorbid conditions? And we are starting to uh, stratify them and not put them on the front lines, at least in the beginning. And if they can work from home, that is one intervention that we're sending them home and doing telemedicine or whatever work they can do at home, not to expose them. Because one of the critical things will be that you start uh, depleting your health uh, healthcare workforce, and that is what's happening in Italy right now. So once you develop a respiratory uh, insufficiency or septic shock, your mortality is almost 50%. Okay, um, 
And Tom mentioned, uh, 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 you know, risk stratification for testing. In the ideal world, you would use the number four. You would test anybody who comes with fever or a respiratory symptom. Why? Like Tom mentioned, you want to detect these cases early so you can intervene, quarantine them, isolate them, trace their contacts, put them in quarantine to prevent the spread of the disease. But unfortunately, we don't have enough tests and we, we started doing this the first week and by the day six or seven, we had to cut down because we were running out of uh, tests. So the first uh, individuals that you should prioritize for testing are anybody you hospitalize for a respiratory infection because you really don't want to make place these patients at airborne precautions. Um, and those are the first ones you need to allocate your tests to. The second would be older individuals and the CDC does not define older very precisely. I would take an, a cutoff age of 65 or older um, or with those who have comorbid conditions that are listed there and that we've mentioned in the previous slide. The third, it would be any patient who has been uh, traveling to a hot zone, let's say they come from China, Iran, et cetera, or who've been in contact with a COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, positive case. So this is right now at Cherokee Nation, we're screening uh, patients on categories one through three, and we're not doing four until we have more tests available. But what we're doing with the fours are we assume that they have COVID until proven otherwise, and we can talk about that later. So a couple of frequent questions that we, we've gotten like 50 calls on the first day is how do you do the test, what swab do you use? Uh, so this is a, it's not a video, that's just a, to avoid copyright infringement, I copied this YouTube uh, a photo of this patient getting a, 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 nasal, a nasopharyngeal swab. So the important thing is you only can use synthetic fiber swabs, the, plastic, the ones that have a plastic shaft. Do, you have, do not use the ones with the wooden shaft because it inactivates um, the PCR technique that you're using to amplify the virus. Um, you have to put the swab all the way back, stop before the brain, but don't be shy. The patient has to at least show a tear or show a little bit of discomfort. It's not painful, but it will, be, uh, it will cause some, some discomfort. Um, you leave the swab in one nair for about two or three seconds, and then you spin it around a little bit. You take it out and you place it on the other nair, the same swab, and that's what you send to the lab. Originally, the CDC was recommending nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal, or sputum. Now their preference is nasopharyngeal, so you only need to do this. For those of you who have film arrays, which is a multiplex PCR for other respiratory viruses, you can use the same swab for the film array and reflex it to a COVID-19 test if you're uh, in your lab, so you don't have to waste swabs. The reason I'm saying this, because we are running out of swabs and, uh, and viral transport media, uh, not only on, on the test sites, so you have to be careful how you use them. Another question that we're getting a lot is we're running out of PPE equipment, specifically N95 masks, and people are starting to panic. So the good news is that the CDC at least has uh, accepted that if there's no, not gonna be any aerosolization, um, you can use your surgical mask. So uh, Whitney will go over this a little bit more in detail, uh, but in this graph that you see, I'm sorry, in this graph you can see that if you're in a clinic, an emergency room, or an acute care, and the patient's not gonna be intubated, the patient's not gonna be nebulized, you're not gonna induce sputum, so you're not gonna produce aerosols, a surgical mask is safe enough. But if you're going to do all those procedures, then it's when you, you definitely need an N95. And what we want to do is preserve our N95 for, for the situation, and we have patients like in the ICU that will, we will be needing to use all those procedures or, do all, or some of these procedures. So you have to um, keep a check on what your supply is, and when you think you're gonna be running out of N95 for those procedures, we were keeping a stock of at least one month, and we're, we're gonna to switch to surgical masks. Now, if there's a plethora of N95s, go ahead and use them, that's fine, but this is a way to avoid panicking and running out of masks too soon. And the other thing you can do is reuse your N95s, and Whitney can comment on that. 
So finally, I, I just chose this CDC recommendation. If you go through the CDC web, website, it's fantastic. It's very large. It's a little bit difficult to navigate and try to find exactly the answer of the question you want. And one of the questions that came up very frequently was, I have a patient, let's say you see a patient, a 20 year old with fever and cough, they don't have uh, comorbidities, they haven't been in China, they have not had contact with anybody with COVID-19, so that falls in category four. You're not gonna test them because you don't have tests. So you send them home and tell them to isolate. Of course, you do a flu test first, which is easy. If they don't have the flu, then you send them home. And the question is, so when do you take them out of isolation? because you may not able to ever test that patient. So the CDC came with guidelines that are not exactly for that situation, but you can extrapolate them. These guidelines are non-test-based strategy for patients in which you have confirmed COVID-19. And what it says is that at least three days after they have recovered from the fever and their symptoms, and there are some details that you can read there, um, you can take them out of isolation as long as it's also been more than seven days since they started with symptoms. So just assume, even if you don't have a test, that your patient with cough and fever has COVID. Assume that they have COVID, send them home, isolate them. If they don't require hospitalization, three days after they have resolved their symptoms, and at least seven days after they have initiated their symptoms, you can take them out of isolation. This is a very practical recommendation, believe me, because we get like 40 calls a day under this situation in particular. And of course, there's the test-based strategy. I'm not going to go into detail. That's a more a straightforward one and the one that we as providers are used to, to do in any type of infection of, that we need a test of cure. Another important thing, individuals, we do not test individuals who do not have symptoms, even if they have a high-risk contact. Because we don't, not because it's not indicated, it's just we don't have tests for that category uh, at this moment. Okay, I'll hand it over to Whitney um, for the next few slides, and then I'll wrap up with the uh, MMWR uh, article that we read recently I want to share with you. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Whitney Essex. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work in infectious diseases with Dr. Mara here at the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, and have been involved in a lot of the planning at the clinic level um, for what we can do to help um, protect our patients and protect our staff and be prepared for when staff um, do get sick. Um, so the first thing that I think has um, been widely publicized is um, limiting the number of entrances into your facility. Um, right now we are um, encouraging that facilities screen people who are walking in for cough or fever and, um, and offering masks to those individuals uh, that they can put on before even um, accessing the rest of the building. Um, one piece of advice would be to have a protocol ready for when you do have a positive response. Um, we are going to be implementing temperature taking at the front of the doors um, very soon and your frontline staff need to know what to do with a positive um, or with a with a high reading and um, and those people need to be limited to uh, maybe walking outside instead of inside and um, and that plan is really important for everyone to be on the same page. Um, triaging patients with respiratory symptoms to a designated area. Uh, anyone who has um, these symptoms like um, the cough and fever are the main things that we're um, leaning on right now should sit not in the same waiting area as your well patients and um, just today, the Cherokee Nation announced that all well visits will be canceled until further notice. So we're, we're not even seeing patients if they're, if they're not ill. And, um, <clears throat> and having a dedicated team to take care of those ill patients so that you're minimizing the number of staff who are potentially exposed to COVID-19. Um, like Dr. Mara mentioned earlier, it would also be important to stratify the risk of your employees so that you are um, 
protecting the most vulnerable employees from um, from having repetitive contact with people who have COVID-19. Um, a process for tracking patients and results and that um, seems to be more complicated than what it should be but because of the way that our our profession works you may have providers who or the health um, the electronic health record that notifies the ordering provider of the test result and no one else and if that person is gone or they're sick and they don't get the result that their patient was positive for COVID-19, they're not able to communicate that information. So having a backup of how to process and track those results and make sure that people are getting notified as soon as possible is, um, is very important. Uh, keeping your healthcare workforce healthy, we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide, but uh, having a, in, in the beginning, since we are not heavily affected yet, um, we are <clears throat> sending home anyone who can work from home and those that are in high risk groups. And, um, you know, I know that not every station within um, the Indian Health Service is, is capable of doing that just because of the size and the, um, the volume of patients versus the, the number of workers. But um, trying to implement some sort of telehealth system would be um, really important and maybe, um, maybe even telephone visits if possible. Um, Another thing which we hear a lot about on the news is trying to pa uh, manage patients at home if possible, um, extending refills uh, when possible, moving to a 90-day script instead of a 30-day script uh, could be helpful, and, um, and delivering medications when possible. So for employee health, I, I just want to share what we, we've spent a lot of time working on what to do for employee health over the next few months. And um, we divided our, our employee health issues into two groups, the travelers and the non-travelers. Now we're hoping that the travelers um, phase out over time, but this is where we've had the biggest problem over the past couple of weeks in our area because of spring break and people have been all over the country and outside of the country and unfortunately um, many of them who could have canceled their plans didn't and so now we're dealing with the aftermath of trying to um, to protect our other employees and our patients. Um, so we have a process of um, of dividing our travelers into four categories based on uh, it, it's all a case by case basis. Um, those who are deemed to be able to return to work without any restrictions. Those who can work with restrictions, meaning they may have been to an area that was um, medium risk or um, uh, for example, they, they maybe went to Oregon, it's not a high, it wasn't a high risk area when they were there. They uh, come back and they say um, they say that they're fine to work. They're asymptomatic, and we would uh, have them ask them to wear a mask when they're within uh, six feet of any other person while they're working for the next 14 days. Um, another category, the third one, is to get tested. This is a traveler who returns and has symptoms and um, they would be quarantined at home until their results are available and then we reevaluate. And then those who've gone to a high risk area um, are asking to self uh, quarantine at home for 14 days. And we have connected them with an employee health nurse case manager who will be, um, uh, communicating with that employee daily and um, recording temperatures and uh, symptoms during that 14-day quarantine period. 
For our non-travelers, we have found that we're getting many, a variety of calls from employees who haven't traveled and they have lots of different things they want. They, they are um, concerned about just for ease of, um, of classifying them and trying to give them the best recommendation at the time because the recommendations seem to change just by the hour uh, some days, but we divide them into the symptomatic group and the asymptomatic. And, and I do want to stress, this is what we're doing at our health centers, but, um, but it's not what, um, Jorge, what am I trying to say? It's not something that IHS is driving out as the requirement, right, Jorge? Yeah, yeah. so this is uh, this our, advice. Our, our advice based on yeah. our assessment of the situation and our resources. Yeah, so, um, so like, like I was saying before, this, this may vary based on your resources and, and uh, what you have access to as far as um, employees and, and services. <clears throat> Whitney, just really quick, just because um, the question is specific to this, where are you and how are you defining high risk area? Okay, so um, we are using the CDC map for in, for in the US, we're using the CDC map that has the cases limited. Any red state on that map is, um, is what we're considering high risk. So right now it would be Washington, California, um, and there's, New there's, yeah, New York. And, um, and that's what we're going with and it, it is gonna you know, start changing pretty quick, um, but that's what we're using right now. And the international ones, the ones that are... Right, right. Um, I think Eric put the map up, so that's, that's what we're using right now. So we are having our people tested if they're symptomatic, if they've had a cough or fever. We first test them for flu. If that's negative, we have access to film array, which, um, which will tell us if they have uh, one of like 22 other viruses. And um, if that's negative, then we're, we're doing a COVID-19 test. Um, we quarantine the employee at home until their results are available and then we reevaluate their situation. We are taking asymptomatic um, employees, but, uh, in, and also trying to divide them a little bit um, into those who've had contacts with uh, symptomatic or people who they are concerned could have COVID-19, and then those who have a, a confirmed contact with COVID-19 and dividing them into, um, you, you, it's okay for you to work, you don't have symptoms, but you need to wear a mask and you need to um, uh, apply social distancing and then quarantine for anyone who has had contact with a confirmed case of COVID-19 and we're, we're recommending that quarantine for 14 days. So um, we, for personal protective equipment, um, the, the four items that you see listed there, what's recommended right now, and I just want to stress that um, the gown, the non-sterile gloves, eye protection, all very necessary. The N95 mask can be reused up to five times is what um, we are doing. Or if a person wants to wear the same mask for an entire shift, that is fine too. Um, and uh, the healthcare providers need to receive training on and demonstrate an understanding of how to use uh, their equipment, how to put it on appropriately, how to take it off appropriately so that they don't um, contaminate uh, anything else or ex expose themselves unnecessarily, how to dispose of their equipment, when they should use it and what they should be using. And of course, um, all equipment has limitations and nothing is 100%. Um, but I think as health centers and clinics, we have to be mindful of previous experiences and um, 
know, in the Ebola outbreak, there were healthcare workers exposed who, um, who felt like they didn't get the training necessary to protect themselves and, and they ended up suing their facilities and won after they contracted Ebola. So um, not that that's going to happen here, but it, it, I think we all have to keep, keep that in mind that it's our responsibility to make sure that our um, employees are trained appropriately